And welcome to the live coverage of day one of the debate on the appropriation bill for the 2017-2018 financial year. We are broadcasting via the National Television Network, also live streaming by the St. Lucia, uh, Government of St. Lucia portal, Facebook page, and also YouTube channel. The debate on the appropriation bill is the second part of the budgetary process, the first being the debate on the estimates of revenue and expenditure, which deals with the allocation of funds to various ministries, while the debate on the appropriation bill deals with policy, basically how the budget will be funded. The debate will be presided over by the House Speaker, as 17 parliamentarians are given the opportunity to add their voice and it will be allotted one hour. The debate will be spread over the next three days and so I'm not so certain at this point how many presenters will go today but we will see as time goes on. At this juncture I think it is appropriate for me to highlight some of the high points uh, during the Prime Minister's budget address, which was last evening. And he actually provided an insight into what the debate will focus on. Speaking on the theme, Building a New St. Lucia, the Prime Minister in his budget address focused on some key areas, and some of them are tourism, agriculture, construction, manufacturing, the financial and monetary sector, and in charting the map for a new direction uh, for St. Lucia, the Prime Minister spoke of creating sustainable employment, of course using a tourism-led strategy, um, the introduction of a national apprenticeship program, the reformation in the agricultural sector, and also of a robust um, road infrastructural program, re-engineering social services and reforming government to make it more responsive to the business community and to citizens. Let's hear what the Prime Minister had to say about this last point in particular. Madam Speaker, creating sustainable employment is a priority of this government, and we have pledged to work towards an unemployment rate of no more than 15% by 2021, as stated in our manifesto, it is expected that many of the investments within the coming months will create employment throughout the island, particularly in the sectors of tourism, agriculture, and construction. Clearly, our approach is very different from the Labour Party. We aim to create the enabling environment for growth within the private sector by providing incentives, enhancing government support services, improving efficiency in the public sector, and addressing the existing skills gap. We're currently working on a comprehensive incentives package which will create employment within the private sector and provide much needed support to businesses within St. Lucia. More details will be given on the incentive package within the upcoming months. Madam Speaker, as one of the main contributors to the, our economy, the tourism sector will be re-engineered in order to achieve its full potential and to be used as a catalyst for economic growth. We'll work towards building a tourism product that is globally competitive, environmentally and socially sustainable, and will maximize both backward and forward linkages, particularly in our culture, manufacturing, and construction sectors. Madam Speaker, it is possible to expand the tourism room stock by 2,000 rooms over the next four years throughout the island. Major tourism investments are expected. We've already witnessed the opening of the Royalton where a minimum of 900 jobs have been created during operations. The Harbour Club is expected to be open towards the end of the third quarter of the calendar where 117 rooms are expected to be available and it's envisioned that the minimum of 150 jobs will be available. Coconut Bay plans a 200-room expansion and is expected to employ a minimum of 400 persons during the construction 
and an additional 320 jobs on completion. Madam Speaker, there are some other major investments under active consideration. Well, that was Prime Minister Honorable Alan Shastny um, last night during the budget address, um, speaking of some of the initiatives that the government intends to undertake to curb unemployment. In the area of security, the Prime Minister also spoke of improving security and justice and strengthening border control. This is very important as St. Lucia, uh, as well as the rest of the Caribbean islands, have been considered as a very porous territory with regards to illicit drug trafficking. The second main economic pillar, which at one time was the economic mainstay of the country, and I refer to her to agriculture, uh, it, this is also expected to bring about a significant turnaround in the industry in creating employment and generating employment as well. I was the Prime Minister again during last night's uh, budget address as he speaks on the various initiatives and reforms to take place in the agricultural industry. Madam Speaker, this government recognizes the importance of agriculture, particularly for creating employment especially in rural communities for reducing poverty, generating income and achieving food security. Our government will create the environment to enable the private sector to participate in the development of the agriculture sector and foster a commercialized approach to livestock, rearing, fresh produce farming and fishing. We will revitalize the banana industry and increase banana production the Ranju farms have been identified as available farmlands, which will be utilized for banana cultivation. These lands will be leased to the farmers through Winfesh. Madam Speaker, a banana productivity improvement project will be undertaken during this financial year. In addition to addressing the issues related to leaf spot control, that project will oversee the expansion of the current acreage by 600 to 1,000 hectare acres arrest decline in production, and rebuild farmers' confidence, increase productivity to 37 to 49 tons per hectare acre, and restore production to satisfy... We turn over to the main business of the House as the Speaker walks to officially begin the debate on the 2017-2018 appropriation bill. Let us pray. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from, from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we, thine unworthy servants, here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech thee to send down thine heavenly wisdom from above to direct and guard us in all our consultations, and grant that we, having Thy fear always before our eyes, and laying aside all private interest, prejudices, and partial affections, the result of all our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the Queen, the public will, peace and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same, in true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all forevermore. Amen. Announcements. 
Honorable members, I wish to remind that according to the stand, standing orders 3211, members should not read their speech, but he or she may read from extracts written on printed papers or books in support of his or her argument and may refresh his or her memory from reference notes. I also wish to remind honorable members that when referring to or reading excerpts from documents, the said documents must be made available beforehand to all members so that honorable members may follow as and when the member speaking is reading therefrom. Finally, let us be reminded that the debate on the appropriation bill shall be confined to the financial and economic status of the country and the general principles of the government policy as indicated by the bill. And that is understanding order 65-2. I wish to remind honorable members that when the House last rose, the question was that the appropriation 2017-2018 bill be read a second time. Honorable Member for Castries East and Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, when I listened to the Prime Minister deliver his first budget address, I decided that I would use a tool of analysis to see if I could make some sense out of it. So I decided to use what the social scientist calls the pest analysis. That means political, economic, social, and technological. I decided I would analyze the budget in these terms to find out whether, whether the objectives of the budget, whether what the Prime Minister was saying, whether it was relevant to the situation that existed in St. Lucia. So, Madam Speaker, I will begin by analyzing the political situation in which this budget was spoken yesterday. This environment, Madam Speaker, is an, is an environment of fear, vindictiveness, and victimization. That is the political environment in which this budget was read. There is a lack of transparency and accountability. The government is intolerant and vindictive and appears either for its ministers or its surrogates to abuse, to victimize, and to attack anyone who dares speak against them, regardless of who that person is or what organization that person belongs to. The government has openly stated that its mission its political mission is to make members of the opposition cry, to make them suffer, to make them cry. That has been the stated position of the government. And this position has been endorsed because he hasn't, he's not said that should not happen. He's not contradicted it. It has been endorsed but done no other than the prime minister who has agreed that the mission of his government is to make the opposition cry. And that crime, no one is spared from that crime. The church, the National Trust, the nice workers, reporters, <coughs> the, the cleaners at the Castries Constituency Council, all of them are made to cry. Madam Speaker, it's an environment of revenge. And again, Madam Speaker, no one is spared from that revenge. Even we inside of here, that represents 37,000 people, are not spared from that revenge. And if you use your right to say something, they sit back in their state-funded chairs and tell you, now you know that, and that's why you're dead now. That is how they respond, Madam Speaker, when you tell them about the atrocities that they commit against 
the people of St. Lucia. But I want to inform the government, Madam Speaker, that in this political environment, we will never be silenced. The opposition will never be silenced. We will speak the truth, we will speak what the people of St. Lucia want us to see, and we will represent the people of St. Lucia in the way that they seem fit. That is why, Madam Speaker, on the sending of me, next week Wednesday, we are going to need a protest demonstration in the streets of Castries to tell the government that we are dissatisfied. And it's not an orange march, Madam Speaker. It's a march of protest. It's a march of dissatisfaction with how they have been running the country. So, Madam Speaker, the environment in which we operate, I want to inform the government that the opposition will never be extinguished. We will never be made to submit. We will never be beaten into submission. We will never be made to be quiet. Regardless of the revenge, regardless of the victimization, regardless of the vindictiveness, we shall never be quiet. We shall not be made to be silent, Madam Speaker. So the government will have no, child, no choice but to live with that, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the political environment in which we operate is an environment where the government wants to appear or they want to make the public believe that the Labour Party did nothing, that we were a government, that we were useless, we did nothing, we did nothing for the country, Madam Speaker. But, Madam Speaker, our party has a proud legacy, a legacy of achievement, a legacy of improvement, and we will, we, we will remain, Madam Speaker, to live this legacy, and when the time comes, to continue this legacy for the people of St. Lucia. It's, it's been 11 months, Madam Speaker, since the government has been in power. It's been 11 months. And in that 11 months, St. Lucia has never seen so much revenge, so much division, so much vindictiveness, so much lack of transparency. That has never happened in the history of St. Lucia for that 11 months in which this government has been in power. It has never happened, Mr. Speaker. And this, and I heard the Prime Minister speak about civil servants and the public service. The problem, Madam Speaker, with this government is the political interference in the public service. That is the problem. And that political interference has reached the highest levels. It has reached the level of cabinet secretary. Never before in the history of St. Lucia has a government seen it right to dismiss a cabinet secretary. Never before. But it's because of this government's vindictiveness that they've, sought, they've seen it right to dismiss a cabinet secretary, Madam Speaker. So, how can a country survive? How can the economy of the country survive? How can the people of St. Lucia have the spirit that is needed to develop St. Lucia in that environment, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, th this environment is so caustic. It's so filled with vindictive, vindictiveness and revenge that the government, a surrogate of the government, Madam Speaker, went on public radio and he threatened to bring back the Immigration Ordinance Act number 15 of 1983, or the David England Bill. A bill that the Labour Party saw it fit to remove from the books of the people of St. Lucia. A surrogate of the government has gone on public radio and threatening to bring it back just to handle legitimate dissent. How, Madam Speaker, how can we create a new vision for St. Lucia in that environment? How is it possible? How is it possible to have a new vision? How is it possible to have a new beginning in that atmosphere of revenge and vindictiveness and lack of transparency? Our party, Madam Speaker, has a proud record, a proud legacy. And if you compare our first 11 months to their first 11 months, I will just highlight a few of the things that we did in our first 11 months. Madam Speaker, in our first 11 months, we repurchased the Black Bill lands. We commenced work on the Badalil. We reintroduced STEP. We introduced a $500 bursary for all successful students at the common entrance. We commence NICE. We commence SMILE. We stabilize the leadership of the St. Lucia Police Force by the confirmation of Vernon Francois and other senior members of the force. 
we introduced the labor code. We introduced the construction stimulus. We introduced an immediate response to black Sigatoka. We had a, a Wasco, an, an amnesty at Wasco for, for fees, for fees for people who could not afford. We engaged the business sector to address the ease of doing business. We had a subsidy to minibus drivers. We adjusted the pass-through uh, mechanism to allow for free month exchange. We renovated the Tiroche Miko Health Center. We reintroduced the sports program at school. And I noticed, Madam Speaker, in the Prime Minister's budget, there was only one line relating to sports. We constructed the Dubonnet Bridge, Madam Speaker. And we had a subsidy on chicken feed for $5 per bag. These were some, a few of the things that we did in our 11 months of government. And if you compare what they did in the 11 months of government, all you'll find, Madam Speaker, is conflict, vindictiveness, revenge, and all sorts of things which I will not want to see in this honorable house. Madam Speaker, what is the economic situation, the, the economic environment under which the Prime Minister has delivered his budget? Madam Speaker, it's a position where the fundamentals of the economy, as outlined in the budget summary, Madam Speaker, are flawed. The budget will result in the country being in a serious deficit position. Or in other words, Madam Speaker, the country will be in a financial hole for $220 million. That is the deficit that this government is carrying in in this budget, $220 million worth of deficits. And if you compare that to 2017, Madam Speaker, you will see that the deficit at the end of 2016 was $62 million. So this year, we are carrying or we, have, we intend to pass a budget that will have the country 4.7% deficit to GDP as compared to, as compared, Madam Speaker, to 1.4 when this government inherited the economy of St. Lucia. Honorable Two. Leader of the Opposition, my apologies. I just realized that you'll be on your feet for a while and you, have, you do not have the rostrum. Would you like? No, I'm sorry. Thanks. Madam Speaker, the government, the budget has St. Lucia in the position where the recurrent deficit that is the revenue for taxes and unavoidable expenses and wages has increased by 109%. It was $37 million when they got the economy and they've changed it to minus $78 million, Mr. Speaker. An increase of 109%. This means that this government will have to borrow $78 million to meet its unavoidable expenses. It will have to borrow $78 million, Mr. Speaker, because the deficit, the recurrent deficit, is now $78 million. And these are not figures from the fairy tales. The, and you can go and you can compare whatever year you want. The fact is, what you found, what this government found, and what they intend to bring it to will lead to a disaster. And Madam Speaker, if you look at the, at the current surplus, the current surplus, Mr. Speaker, when this government took the economy at the end of 2016, the current surplus, Madam Speaker, was $89 million. They are projecting that it will, it will go down to $46 million, a reduction of $43 million of 48 percent. The primary deficit, which is the difference between the current expenditure and the total revenue, is reversed. That is the, the economic environment in which the Prime Minister read his budget. The primary deficit is reversed, Mr. Speaker, from a surplus of $102 million at the end of 2017, at the end of 2016, to a deficit position of $50 million. A negative shift, Madam Speaker, of $152.8 million. That is the reality, Madam Speaker, 
And that's the economic reality in which the Prime Minister read his budget. Madam Speaker, the government intends to borrow to increase capital expenditure by $140 million, making the budget a deficit budget, deficit of $220 million. Madam Speaker, we cannot continue on this trend. And what the Prime Minister hopes for is for a fairy godfather. He's hoping for a fairy godfather to land in St. Lucia and solve all the problems when he, because of the lack of fiscal discipline and the lack of courage to tell St. Lucia, this is a situation that we face and let us work together to improve it. What, we, what he intends to do is to quiet the opposition, to victimize them, to, to ostracize them and look for a fairy godfather. Madam Speaker, the budget deficit is real. It's not fabricated, and no amount of flashing mirrors, no amount of bluff and fluff can stop the reality of the deficit that the Prime Minister is leading the country into. There is nothing. There, there are no arguments. And even though he goes back and he speaks about 20, he likes, Madam Speaker, to talk about 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I just want, I, I did not intend to, to, to do that, but I just want to bring the Prime Minister back to the 2012 budget, when the overall deficit in 2012 had widened to $254 million, equivalent to 7.6% of GDP from 166.5 million in the year 2010 to 2011. That is, that is the 20, that is the 2012 situation that we inherited. So when he intends or pretends to want to go back and pretend that the economy was in the economy, we are the ones who caused the economy to be where it, where it is, the facts do not substantiate that because economies are measured in terms of reality. And if you look at the 2016 figures and you look at the figures that the Prime Minister is, is pretending to want to say will lead the country to growth, you will realize, Madam Speaker, that we are leading in, we are in a very slippery slope and the country is leading to a major fiscal disaster. Madam Speaker, the, the economic environment in, under which we operate. Madam Speaker, when this government came into power, again, with the eye, the eye on vindictiveness, they stopped a number of projects. And one of the projects that they stopped is the airport project. And I heard the Prime Minister say that they, they, are, they are going to tell the public of St. Lucia how they'll finance the airports. Madam Speaker, I just want to go back a little and tell you the situation regarding the airports, the expansion to the Hiwanora International Airport that this government inherited. In 2014, Madam Speaker, the government made a policy a decision to explore the redevelopment of Hiwanora International Airport via a PPP, a public-private partnership arrangement. The government of St. Lucia, Madam Speaker, through SLASPA, engaged the International Financial Cooperation, the IFC, which is a subsidiary of the World Bank as the lead advisor to structure and advise on the feasibility of that transaction. Upon the receipt of a due diligence report from the IFC, Cabinet in 2015, the Cabinet of, of Ministers approved the IFC when they recommended that we pursue the redevelopment and financing of the Iranian International Airport via a PPP structure. That means, Madam Speaker, that the private sector would manage the project, the private sector would finance it, the private sector would construct it, 
the government of St. Lucia would lease the airport. It was clear. The government would lease the airport for 30 years to that private sector organization. At the end of that period, the airport would return to the people of St. Lucia. What is more significant, Madam Speaker, is the private sector body would not ask for any liability, no contingent liability on the treasury of St. Lucia. So our debt, our debt, which the Prime Minister quite rightfully <coughs> makes the point that we have to deal with, then it would not affect our debt. So the government would have had a situation where it would have had an airport without pain, without having to incur one cent of debt on the treasury of St. Lucia. Because, Madam Speaker, we know the history of airports and the airports in the region. Any country, any country that has built an airport, Madam Speaker, there is always a whole mass of corruption surrounding that airport. It happens in every island where an airport is built. Because, Madam Speaker, an airport is, is major money. Major money. Anytime you talk about building airport, somebody wants to get involved in something. So we decided that our government would take the construction of the airport completely away from that situation. We would take it completely away from that situation and we look for a private sector body, a private sector body that would put in their own finance, put in their own finance and would build a top a modern airport for the people of St. Lucia. Madam Speaker, so we decided that we would come into what is called a concessionary arrangement with a concessionaire. And I want to tell you, Madam Speaker, when we left government in 2016, two of the world's biggest airport developers had tendered to build the airport for St. Lucia. Two of the world's biggest airport developers had tendered to build an airport for the people of St. Lucia at no cost to them. And that agreement, Madam Speaker, was as follows. The site and immovable assets of the airport would be leased to the concessionaire for the term of the concession contract and shall remain the property of the government. The concessionaire shall pay the authority that is SLASPA, a share of the annual gross revenues generated by the airport as agreed by the parties. The airport revenues. The concessionaire shall be entitled to collect, receive, and retain aeronautical, aeronautical revenues during the concession period in accordance with the Hunora International Airport Development Act <coughs> and this concession agreement. The concessionaire shall collect and remit to the owner, all navigation and communication charges and passenger security charges. So the government would share with the concessionaire the fees charged on the airports. And the concession fee, a concession fee shall be paid to the government, to the owner, on the 10th business day of each month during the concession period, except for the installment payment during the first month and shall be based on gross, on gross revenue set, set forth in the monthly unaudited financial statements or the concessionary period for the preceding month. So that means the government would share the returns immediately as soon as the airport is constructed. But, Madam Speaker, in its usual, in its usual vindictiveness, the government said to stop it. And they, didn't, they did not even have the courtesy to discuss, to discuss with the opposition what was the rationale why we went into a PPP. But the fact is, let's make them cry. But there are other reasons, Madam Speaker, why this airport development was changed. There are many other reasons, but they will be said in the fullness of time. So, Madam Speaker, if the government had continued construction of, of, of this airport, we would have had by this year, October, the airport, construction of the airport would have started. People would have been employed by this October. Because at the time, two of the largest concessionary, two of the biggest 
cons two of the biggest airport operators had already turned that man speaker. And the Prime Minister had a meeting with the IFC. He had a meeting in IFC. He was told that man speaker. I will not tell him what the IFC thought of him after the meeting. So, Madam Speaker, the government is a government of lost opportunity. Lost opportunity. <coughs> Just to be vindictive. They've made the people of St. Lucia lose an opportunity to get an airport, a modern airport, without having a payment of one cent on the national debt of St. Lucia, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the government stopped the Viewfort commercial building. The government stopped the building where the people of Viewfort, as we speak, whilst, while we look for fairy godfather to develop Viewfort, the Viewfort building would have been under construction people would have, been, would have been employed. And what's the reason? There was no planning approval. A government, a government, a government that signs agreements, a government that gives or intends to give more than 900 acres of land and sign an agreement, and now you see that a, a building that's going up, for the, for the people of Viewfort, you can you stop it. Because you say there's no planning approval, just to embarrass the member for Viewfort South and to make him cry. Madam Speaker, they stopped the Sufra Square. They stopped the Sufra Square. What was the reason for stopping the, 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 the Sufra Square? They said it was not the architectural design. So they went in in their vindictive and dictatorial manner. In their vindictive and dictatorial manner. They stopped it. Stop it. I'm the boss. Stop it. Up to now, up to now, Madam Speaker, the Sufre Square has not recommenced. And the people of Sufre, they want their square. But up to now, you see, Madam Speaker, when you stop the square for, or for the people of Sufre, you do not affect any one of us, you know. You don't even affect the representative for Sufre. You affect the people of Sufre. But you stop the square just to show that you are the boss. I stop it. And up to now, up to this day, the Sufre, the, the, Sufre, the Sufre Square has not commenced. Madam Speaker, the government stopped the Grosley Highway, the, Gros the Grosley to Shock Highway. Again, Madam Speaker, again, a highway that $150 million funds, a loan from KFED, had been negotiated. It entailed the construction or the reconstruction of all the bypass roads. A list of bypass roads, these would have been reconstructed, and then work would have commenced on the highway, Madam Speaker. So while the work is happening on the highway, the, the secondary roads, work would have commenced, would have continued on them. The government stopped it. They stopped it, Madam Speaker. And now they have the Ministry of Infrastructure in an embarrassing position of trying all sorts of things, soft measures, all sorts of things, instead of allowing the highway construction to continue. But again, Madam Speaker, to make them cry. To be vindictive, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the government stopped the CDP contracts. And a whole, a whole story related to the CDP contract. You would believe, you would really believe there was something in there, Madam Speaker, and on, on, on the CDP contract. Madam Speaker, you know why? Because they assume, you see, they have assumed that when they do these things, they affect Labour Party people. They assume that. So what they do is they stop it. But the intention, Madam Speaker, is to make the Labour Party people suffer. So they stop all the CDP contracts. And they have all sorts of excuses why they have stopped the, the airport, Madam Speaker. So the airport, the airports, the buildings, the square, and the CDP contract. So, Madam Speaker, it's a government of lost opportunity. It's a government that has a lost, lost opportunity to continue the development of St. Lucia. Just because they want to, they want to be vindictive, and they want to make the people of the Labour Party cry. Madam Speaker, continuing the pest analysis. What is a social environment under which this budget is being read? It's a social environment, Madam Speaker, of conflict. Madam Speaker, when the government won the election, I, as leader of the opposition, I congratulated the Prime Minister. I said to the Prime Minister, we are not about believing that we, are the, we only have to be in power. We are saying that the government is in power, we respect the people's rights. We respected the democracy of, of the people. In fact, some of our supporters are saying to us, you are too quiet, you are too quiet. We said, no, let the government run the country because we live in a democratic system. 
the people have elected governments. Let the government, let the government run the country. No man speaking. No, no. They started. They have to start. They had the, the revenge, the hatefulness was so great that they could not, they could not settle and run the country. So, Madam Speaker, they are in conflict with everybody. The government is in conflict with everyone. I have never seen a government in 11 months that have found itself in conflict with everyone like that, Madam Speaker. So what, the government is in conflict with the church. And Madam Speaker, I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm not going to get involved in playing I'm more of a Christian than anybody else, or playing I'm holier than anybody else, or playing when I die, I'll go to heaven, and then people will go to hell. All I will say on the church situation, I'll, I'll just want, Madam Speaker, to make a simple quotation. The words of Oscar Romero, the Archbishop of El Salvador. And here's what he said. Two quotations, Madam Speaker. He said, Madam Speaker, that the church must suffer for speaking the truth, for pointing out sin, for rooting sin. No one wants to have a sore, a sore spot touched. And therefore, a society with so many sores twitches when someone has the courage to touch it and say, you have to treat that. You have to get rid of that, man speaker. And the, that quotation comes from Archbishop Oscar Romero in the book, The Violence of Love. And one more quote from him, Madam Speaker. He says, when the church hears the cry of the oppressed, it cannot but denounce the social structures that give rise to and perpetuate the misery from which the cry arises. This is all I will say, Madam Speaker, as it relates to the conflict between the church and the government, Madam Speaker. But, Madam Speaker, I also want to, to speak about, just shortly, about the Archbishops of Canterbury and York, Madam Speaker, when in England, when they voice their concerns about the elections. So the church, so it's not uncommon, Madam Speaker, for the church to get involved in these matters, Madam Speaker. But we sit here and we say that the church is better off under the United Workers' Party. But no surrogate of the St. Lucia Labour Party has ever attacked the church, has ever attacked the church as surrogates or United Workers Party have done in the last 11 months. Now then, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, but I want to say to those who profess to be Christian, I want to quote from them um, James, James chapter 1 to 26, and it says, Madam Speaker, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep up tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Ma so this man speaker is a social environment under which the church, under which the church operates under this government man speaker. Man speaker, it's an environment of unacceptable levels of crime. And we will never do like them and blame the government for crime. We, we won't do that. We will never do it, Madam Speaker. But fact is, there are unacceptable levels of crime in the country. That's a fact. And we must, we must try our best to reduce that unacceptable level of crime. We have to agree and admit to that, Madam Speaker. But we will not. We will not do like them. Remember, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister says, do, when he was campaigning, are you feeling safe in St. Lucia? Are you feeling safe on the, on the solution of your party? Elect me and I'll make you safe. The same Prime Minister who said he signed for the reduction of gas. The same Prime Minister. Yes, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, we have un unacceptable levels of crime, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we have journalists being called dishonest. Journalists being threatened, Madam Speaker. We have some very uncanny arrests of journalists. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we have... We have talk of hacked emails and tapped telephones. That's the environment in which we operate, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we have uncertainty over impacts. We have not yet caught the, the, the we, not, we have impacts has not come to its logical conclusion. That is creating social unrest. 
Man, Speaker, the government has failed to create an environment of stability, Man, Speaker. You have political affairs in the public service. I made a point about the cabinet secretary, Man, Speaker. So the government interferes directly in, in the public service. Government ministers use public servants to go and search people's premises, Man, Speaker. Man, Speaker, this is the environment in which we operate. This is the social environment which, in which we operate, Man, man Speaker. Man, Speaker, the government has a responsibility to create and engender social calm. It has a responsibility not to be fighting, not to be, not to be the aggressors, but to be the ones to calm the waters, Man, Speaker. To, because that's the government's responsibility. Not to be aggressive, but the government has a responsibility. That is what they say they were elected for, Man, Speaker. But what the government believes is by aggression, they can quiet the opposition. By aggression, they can be revengeful, Man Speaker. That's what they believe. But I'm saying, I can tell them, Man Speaker, it has never worked anywhere in the world if it does not work in St. Lucia. We will not be quiet. We will, not be, we will not be made to submit. So I can tell you, you're wasting your time. Man Speaker, the social environment that we have, environment where a few thousand nice workers were dismissed. And they laugh at that. They laugh. This boy only had contracts. Oh, the contract's finished. Contract's finished. You know, contracts. Man, Speaker, the government pretends that the nice workers were people who we were doing a favor. Man, Speaker, the nice workers were St. Lucians who were earning a living to support themselves and their families. Man, Speaker, and again, the Prime Minister doesn't tell you that there were nice workers who worked at the transport board. There were nice workers at the immigration department. And if you go to the transport board now, you will see lines of people, lines, man, speaker, and they complain. If you go to the immigration department, the people that are complaining that things take too long because of the absence of nice workers, man, speaker. Man, speaker, the nice workers are involved in vector control, in the control of vectors. The nice workers are involved in that. They send them home. The nice workers were employed at the forensic lab. They were nice workers at the forensic lab, man, speaker. They send them home. They send them home. Yes, they were at the forensic lab. There were nice workers involved working at doing plain field maintenance. They send them home. There were nice workers working in farmers. They send them home also. And man, speaker, and the sad thing is the government doesn't have any empathy to say, <clears throat> listen to me, we had, we had fiscal problems. So, the government boastfully, oh, you all had a contract. So, contract is end, go. That's, that is the government, man, speaker. That's the government. You see, man, speaker, at least the government could have said, could have said, we apologize for having to send you home. We are, we are very sorry to send you home. We apologize. We believe that the, we can't afford to, to employ you now, so we send you home. But there is the arrogance, man, the contempt, the arrogance. The, 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 I have power. I'll do you what I want. I'm in charge. I run things. Go home. Because you all will, will just contract with government speaker. Man speaker. But let me tell the government, man speaker. And the most experienced member over there will tell them politics is as perennial as the grass. So, man speaker, the social environment in which we operate, man speaker. The social environment in which we operate is not an environment conducive for any development or any growth, Man Speaker. Man Speaker, the government is in conflict with, with the National Trust. Man Speaker, you think a government can look for problems with, with the National Trust? The people who have the responsibility for conservation in the country? Man Speaker, the National Trust anywhere in the world. In England, man, man speaker, the National Trust gets a subvention from the government. In Barbados, the National Trust gets a subvention from the government. Man speaker, any developer always wants to speak to National Trust to get the blessing of National Trust before they embark on any major development. But this government, because the National Trust has expressed its concern over a major development, a major development, Madam Speaker, a major development, major. 
they have decided to silence them. And listen to their schools. Listen to their schools. Listen to their schools. The National Trust hasn't prepared a business plan. Yeah, right. The National Trust has assets they must leverage on. Yeah, right. The National Trust must give us, must give us a, a document to show how they intend to raise money. Madam Speaker, but you give money to many other places. You give money to the Archaeological and Historical Society. Why didn't you ask them for the same thing? Why you choose the National Trust to do that? You know why, Madam Speaker? Because you want to show you are boss. That's what you want to show. And Madam Speaker, those who have conscience on that side should say to the Prime Minister, that's wrong. Because, Madam Speaker, we have to live in St. Lucia. So you want to show you are boss. You are the boss. You run things. So you, in, in a stroke of a pen, you decide that you're going to stop the convention. And here's, and you use all kinds of excuses, Madam Speaker. The National Trust has assets. The Forestry Division has assets. The Forest Division has 221,000 acres of forest, but you still give it $2.6 million. So why don't you tell the Forest Division to leverage on the assets and, and, get, and get money for themselves? You, 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 still, you still give it, you gave it $2.8 million this year. So why, why, so why the National Trust? You know, Madam Speaker, the National Trust dead it did to come up against the government. So they crushed it. And here's the excuse. The, the Labour Party gave permission to build a dolphin park. Madam Speaker, the Labour Party never gave any permission to build a dolphin park at Prison Point. Never. It has never given permission to build a dolphin park at Prison Point. The question is, the question is, what the Leopard, the, the Leopard, man speaker, gave approval in principle for a dolphin park to be considered and approved to reason project, project in Canaries. That's what, it, that's what our party did, man speaker. Nothing else. But the, the normal thing, man speaker, any time you find the government, they blame you. It's not me, it's you. So you, you, anything you speak of, the government always has a right to blame us. Not them, they blame us, man speaker. So they've come up with this flashing mirror. Oh, you get permission for a dolphin park. Where? But, man speaker, that happened in 2013. But times have changed. Times have changed, man speaker. And the captivity of dolphins has now become a serious problem. Virgin Hoyness, man speaker, has said that they will, not, they will not promote a country with new dolphin parks. Man speaker, there have been several articles published about dolphin parks, man speaker. So why can't the government talk? Why can't, I mean, man speaker, a government, if 11, you say everybody vote for you. You, you, the government says everybody, you vote, everybody vote for you. Why don't you speak to the people who voted for you? So, man speaker, the government has taken this vengeance from the National Trust. And what makes it worse, man speaker, the National Trust was getting involved in the Derek Walcott the Derek Walcott Museum on Grass Street. And we speak about the inner cities. And Madam Speaker, that if you go, if you, I don't know if you want to, because some, some people, Madam Speaker, they only go there near election time. But I pass there all the time, Madam Speaker. I, I, I'm there all the time, Madam Speaker. I don't, I don't go to any election time, you know. You see, that's the difference between me and them, Madam Speaker. I live, I live what I see. So every day, to go to my home, I go through my constituency. Every day, day and night. I pass through my constituency. I have to face them. Every day, Madam Speaker. So you see, if you go to Grass Street, you will see the Walcott building going up in Grass Street. And you will see how a society has integrated itself around that project. That all the people, all the, all the young guys in the area have engaged around that project, man speaker. And if you go higher up, you will see a park. You will see a park, man speaker. And again, the society has integrated itself around that park. That is part of the renewal of the revival of the inner city. Uh, yes, on, um, yes, Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, on the point of elucidation, the Honorable member has 
Prime Minister. It's. Uh, I just want. I just want to um, to allow me, to make members bring the point. Um, I have said it before. If it is a point of elucidation. We need to know, because if it is a point of elucidation, the member standing determines whether or not he or she yields. So if it is a point of clarification, un understanding order 34B, if you are standing on a point of order, that is different to a point of elucidation. Point of Order 34B, Madam Speaker. The, the, the Honorable Member has indicated that um, Virgin Holidays has indicated that they would not fly or service any country that um, has a dolphin park, Madam Speaker. A new dolphin park. Um, and that, in fact, is, is, is wrong. In fact, what they have said is that Virgin Holidays, which is not the airline, is the tour operator company is that they would not sell any new parks that have dolphins. So it's a very different thing to the airline not flying here or Virgin Holiday is not servicing St. Lucia. They would just not sell any tours to that park. And in fact, the world has criticized Virgin Holidays for the inconsistent position because it, they have decided to continue selling the parks that they were already selling. And they're, all they've said is they're not going to sell any new parks. So I just want to make it very, very clear and hopefully the, the honorable member agrees with my assessment and that what he said was maybe giving people the wrong impression. And, and just that all members understand it. Let us, let us be clear on that. Once a member stands to interrupt or interject another member, immediately call out your standing order so that the other member may hear what standing order you, what point you're standing on, because once it is a point to elucidate, that member does not have to yield if he or she chooses. Thank you. The interruption, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, I am mindful to add five minutes to your time. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Speaker, the, I dealt with the social situation regarding the, the environment which the government operates, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, now I want to briefly go on the technological factors to end my past analysis. Madam Speaker, the technological factors. Madam Speaker, the government speaks about technology, but they haven't made a definitive statement on laptops for students. No statement on that. The government speaks about technology, ICT. The government has not made any statement on the provision of the Wi-Fi hotspots. The Leopard intends to have island-wide hotspots, Madam Speaker. What, what, what is the position, Madam Speaker? And to make it worse, Madam Speaker, I, I understand, and I'm subject to correction, that the government has closed the government contact center, the free level number. The government has closed it and has caused a few people to be out of work, Madam Speaker. Is that, is that true? The government has closed it, Madam Speaker. Again, again, Madam Speaker, the environment under which we operate, Madam Speaker. But, but most of all, Madam Speaker, when we left the Ministry of Infrastructure, there was a CDB-funded streetlight project, an LED project, where the CDB would have made a loan available to the government to replace the street lamps in castries and, and the environs with LED lights, the CDB would give the government a loan, a low interest loan, and the government would repay the loan from the savings they would make on the payment for electricity management. What is wrong? Where has that project gone, Madam Speaker? Where has that project gone? So, Madam Speaker, the pest analysis that I've, that I've made shows that the government 
is completely at sea. It's lost. It hasn't got the fabric. It hasn't got the commitment. It hasn't got the spirit. It hasn't got the temperament, man speaker. Because it is seeped in vindictiveness, in lack of transparency, in revenge, and in making people pay. The budget statement, man speaker. Man speaker, the budget statement from the prime minister was short on details. There were no specifics on important fiscal policy matters. There are several areas in the budget, man speaker, where we are lost. We do not know how the budget will be financed. And, Madam Speaker, I will give you a few. I will give you a few areas, Madam Speaker. On page 12 of the budget, the Prime Minister says, more details on an incentive package within the coming months. On page 21, an announcement on the confirmation of financing will be made this year for the airports. Page 43, we're currently working on a medium-term fiscal policy aimed at crafting a clear path towards growth, the, towards growth while improving St. Lucia's fiscal and debt position. We're currently working. Page 45, reforms that the government proposed to undertake in respect of personal income tax will, be, will, will make an announcement of the changes to be made in the personal income tax prior to its implementation. Page 48, over the next few months, we plan to announce several initiatives which we believe are necessary to place our debt on a sustainable path. Health, Madam Speaker, page 25, and I want to read that one in, in, its, in, its, in its entirety. Page 25 on the health. Our objective, our objective for this sector is to transform the government's role from a direct provider of health care services through hospitals and clinics and direct funder for budget subvention to a policy maker and regulator. What does that mean? Our government aims to achieve this by implementing a two-pronged strategy which pursues public-private partnerships <laughs> for provision of services and the introduction of national health insurance. My government believes that to preserve the future sustainability of the sector, we must establish a financing mechanism. And it continues. Mr. Speaker, my government aims to utilize the resources of the National Health Insurance Fund to finance health care. A number of matters will be addressed, including purchasing and contracting with public-private service providers, consumer choice, the administration of the fund, the regulations for finalization of the packages of services provided to all registrants for the health service. The aim is to provide health coverage for all people as too many are falling through the cracks. Nothing specific, Madam Speaker. Uncertainty, we will, we might, we should. But, Madam Speaker, the only fiscal measure that the government is definitive about is the excise tax, ta tax on gas. And, Madam Speaker, when I heard the Prime Minister say that, I really thought that I was dreaming. Because that's a government, Madam Speaker. That said, because the Labour Party had increased licenses on vehicles and trucks that were killing the people. So they had to have five to stay alive. That's a government man speaker that said that people had to close their trucks to use the exact words of, of the prime minister man speaker. He said that we will help those who have made investments in a truck for transport to focus on the business and get back on the roads quickly and legally. That is because we increase licensing fees by a few cents per day. By a few cents a day. That is a government that said that truckers would be out of business because we increase licensing fees. That's a government that said that minibuses would not make any money because we increase licensing fees. That's a government that said that there would be a hardship on the land because this Delaware party was so wicked, they increased licensing fees. That's what the government said, Madam Speaker. And you know what this government did? This government increased excise tax on gas by $1.50, by 60%. 
when they reduce, because they promise to remove the license fees, to debate back to its original, original level, but they change their mind and they said half. As usual, that's how, that, that, that's how things go. They save the consumer $2.5 million. But, Madam Speaker, what they have done now, what they have done now is that they have taken, and the Prime Minister can tell me if I'm wrong, they have taken from the consumer $18 million by the increase in gas fees, by the increase in excise tax. That's the same government, Madam Speaker. This government led a demonstration, Madam Speaker, for license fees, you know. They led an orange match. They said we were making 680 per gallon of gas. They led a match. Everybody was involved, Madam Speaker. Not all, but most of them were involved. They said we were brutal, we were wicked, because license fees for vehicles were increased. And these license fees in the region, St. Lucia still has the lowest license fees in the region, even at the time when we increased it. But now, that same government, that same government, Madam Speaker, has put a burden on the people of St. Lucia by increasing the excise tax on gas by 150. But Madam Speaker, listen to what happens. They say they reduce VAT by 2.5%, but they increase gas by 60%. They reduce VAT by 2.5%, but they increase VAT by 60%. They, they reduce VAT by 2.5%. And, and they boast about it. Oh, my, my money in the pocket. If the, if the money doesn't go in the consumer, it will go in, in, in profit. Oh, well, 2.5%. But they have increased the price of petrol by 60%. Now, let me, let me preempt them. Let me preempt them. Let, let me preempt them. Let me preempt them. Because I know, I, I'm here long enough to know, to know what you will say. I know, I know long enough. <coughs> in spite of what price gas is on the international market, the consumer of St. Lucia will pay $1.50 more for it. In spite of the price of gas, on the, of oil on the national market, the consumer will pay $1.50 more for it. But you... But you, you made a point that because licenses went up by a few cents per day, that it will cause chaos and confusion in the country. But let me tell you what the increase in gas will cause in the country. Honorable member, you now have 15 minutes within which to complete your presentation. Honorable member for library. Madam Speaker, I move for the invocation of Standing Order 3210 to allow the Leader of the Opposition to conclude his presentation, an additional one hour. Honorable Members, the question is that Standing Order 3210 be invoked to allow the Leader of the Opposition and an additional one hour within which to conclude his presentation. I now put the question. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Honorable Leader of your position, your, your now concluded time is, anticipate is 6.35. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm standing, uh, standing order 34B, at a point of hallucination. The, the honorable minister, the honorable member, has indicated that the gas price is going to go up, or the suggested $1.50 increase is going to increase the gas price by 60%. I, I don't know how the honorable member arrives at that, and I, and I would love him to explain his mathematics on that, because um, that is completely erroneous. That's what he said. He said he said that he's going. The price price is going to increase by 60 percent. So I mean, the gas price now is is, is ten dollars. He's, he's suggesting the price is going to go to sixteen dollars. I don't know how that that mathematic works, and I would love an, an explanation of that, madam. Madam Speaker, I will not. I will allow the prime minister to to interrupt me because his, his interruptions can be easily dealt with. The government made. $2.50 on every gallon of gas. So when you work the price out, $2.50 was given to the government. 
you have increased that to $4. That means you have increased it by $1.50. One dollar, I worry about you. One dollar and fifty cents is sixty percent of two fifty. So the tax is not going on the gas. The bottom line is that the price of gas will go up by one dollar and fifty cents per gallon. That's the point. And you, and you, you let a match, an orange match, because you said that we were making 680 on a gallon of gas, and we, were, and we were so wicked, we had increased licenses by a few cents. You did that. And now you, and now you now, you are increasing the price of gas by $1.50 per gallon of 60%, of 60 percent. Now let me tell you how that is going to affect you. That's going to increase the fuel surcharge. So you have to pay more for electricity. It's going to increase the fuel surcharge. And I'm going to tell you how it's going to, how it's going to affect the tourism industry. I'm going to tell you, it is going to... The, the fuel charge will go up. Because the cost, because you've increased the excise tax on gas. You've increased the excise tax on gas, so the fuel surcharge will increase. And for the man speaker, it will increase, it's even worse. The distributors, the people who have their bread vans, will have to pay more for gas. The people who sell groceries in Bouton and in Anselavedi, will have to pay more for gas. That's right. The people, the minibus drivers, that you increase the fees by, that you you cause in your income to get $440,000 for them in, in fees, in terms of rule ban fees. The price of gas for them will go up. I'll give you an example. You see, that's the flashing mirrors that you, you, you get involved in. You never want to admit the facts. You increase the price of gas by $1.50 per gallon. Admit it. That's what you did. Yeah, but, and, and you boast about it. Yes. Madam Speaker, let, let me tell you what will happen. Let me get an example from a, a minibus driver. And some of them here know a lot about minibus driving. <laughs> Madam Speaker, if you have 18, if you have eight, a minibus driver puts 18 gallons of gas on an average in his vehicle, he puts 18, 18 gallons of gas in his vehicle, Madam Speaker, he'll have to pay an additional $27 per day for gas. $135 per week for gas. $540 per month for gas. That is what you've done to minibus drivers. That's what you've done for Mr. Advisor, Madam Speaker. But you know, but instead of admitting, instead of saying that there's a reason why you do it, you want to defend it. And that's the arrogance of the government. The government is never wrong. Even though people are suffering, they, want, they, they, they have a right to make people suffer. You have a right to make people cry. So you have now, you've, so the poor people now, the poor people that you say you reduce the price of VAT for, the poor people that you say you reduce the price of VAT, they now have to pay more for, for the goods and the services because you've increased the price of gas. Once you've increased the price of gas, you've increased the price of everything in the country. So you've wiped out in one solid swipe you've wiped out the two and a half percent that you reduced the VAT by. That's what you've done. That's what you've done, Madam Speaker. And you, you made the point that when the tax, the tax, the license fees, Madam Speaker, the license fees that we increase by a few cents per day, the incidence of that tax was only on people who owned vehicles and trucks and heavy equipment. That, that's where the incidence of the tax was. But when you change, when you increase the price of gas, Everyone in the country suffers. Everyone. Because everyone directly or indirectly, they have to, they have, there is some part of their life that depends on gas. And that's what you did, Madam Speaker. That's what you did. And you will not do it, and you will not do it and say there was a reason why. You're going to arrogantly say that you're right to do it. You're right. You're going to look for all kinds of flashing mirrors, all kinds of distortions to say that you, where, the, where the fact is, 
that the price of gas, of a gallon of gas, will go up by $1.50. And that is the bottom line, Madam Speaker. That's the bottom line. But, Madam Speaker, it's, it's not only that. The government has done that. But at the same time, at the same time, at the same time, they are doing that. They do not feel the implications of that increase in fuel for the population of the country. But they've removed the subsidy on flour, right, and sugar. And, and I'm coming to that because the Prime Minister said that the $4 million subsidy had removed is because the price of these commodities was going down and the supply warehouse was making money so they would absorb these increased costs. But it's the same Prime Minister who says he intends, he intends to do something with, with, with the, the supply warehouse. If the supply warehouse is doing well, if the supply warehouse is operating at a profit, so you no longer have to have the subsidy on these important commodities, why interfere in it? Why interfere with it? Again, flashing mirrors. You, you said in one breath that he's doing so well because you removed the subsidy, but then you are interfering in it. But, Madam Speaker, to make it worse, Madam Speaker, the increase in the price of gas may affect the cost of bread. It may affect the cost of bread. Because now, what I know they will say, what I know they will say is that the price of gas was $16 and now it's $13. That is irrelevant to the argument. The market finds its own level. That's irrelevant. So when the price is $16, the market operates at a particular level. When the price is $10, the market operates at, at a particular level. So anytime you increase the price, you affect the, you, you affect the cost of living, you affect the cost of living, and you affect the quality of life of the, of the ordinary people in the country. Madam Speaker, the, the, the Prime Minister again, very flippantly, talks about closing down of state enterprises. Very, very flippantly, Madam Speaker. He says, close the marketing board. Close the, close the marketing board. Close the fish marketing corporation. Close Radio St. Lucia. Close, close it. Madam Speaker, people who work there, you know, it's not robots, you know. People work in these institutions. Robots don't work there. People work there. When you send them home, Madam Speaker, you know, it, it, it is alleged, it's alleged, and I won't do like you, when somebody committed suicide, when you all were campaigning, you all say, is, is labor do that? It's alleged, Madam Speaker, that a man died in Shozel because he lost his nice job. It's alleged. But you are flippantly saying that, that you will close, that you will, you will close all these institutions. That you will close Radio St. Lucia. You will close the marketing board. You will close the supply. You will look, in, look into the supply warehouse. You will close, um, which one again? Fish Mining Corporation. You've never said that you will have some counseling for the people who lost their jobs. You will have a, sep a proper separation package. You will get the people some counseling. You will talk to them because they are human beings, not because that you are fortunate and it doesn't affect you. Most people, most people, Madam Speaker, their salary is all they have. They have no salary. They, they have no savings. Most people live on their salaries only. So when you very flippantly say, you'll cut it down. But Madam Speaker, I have a suggestion to the Prime Minister. But as usual, they will not take it. Why can they look to merge the marketing board with the fish and with the fish and the fish marketing corporation. Why can they look to allow the marketing board to run the abattoir in Beaufort? No, I forget they move in the abattoir. I forgot that. Uh, how can how can they how can they why can't they think about it, Madam Speaker? Why can they think about merging these bodies? To save, to save human, human beings. We can't be so flippant about human beings. We can't sit back because we are members of parliament and believe that this people don't really matter. So you want to attack us because we represent them,
but you, be, you believe that we must not speak for them. So, Madam Speaker, you must, have, you must have some heart for the people who will lose their jobs. Postal services, Madam Speaker, postal services. The Prime Minister says again, postal services. But, Madam Speaker, you know, the discussion on postal services is a long discussion. And it's a fact that postal services sometimes cause um, a problem in terms of the economics of the postal service. But postal services, Madam Speaker, they play a unique and significant role in the rural areas. In the rural areas. People expect, because you know, whereas all of us have computers and we have WhatsApp, etc., there are people who do not have that. And they depend on their letters from their letters from the folks in St. Croix, United States. They still receive their checks in the mail, etc. Madam Speaker. So when you close in postal services, when you look at the bottom line, think about these people. Because postal services serve a social need, Madam Speaker. So think about Honorable Member for Labbridge. Um, Madam Speaker, when the Prime Minister delivered his presentation... Sir, you're rising House, on a point of yes, order, I take it. What um, is it? On 34. On what? What is sub it? Subject to the provisions of Standing Orders 20, 26, 38, and 39, a member shall interrupt another member except, and it speak about a point of order, on a point of elucidation. And I would appreciate if this honorable house would allow the leader of the opposition to make his presentation without interruption in the same way that we granted the prime minister last evening. Thank you. Honorable member, I think the correct standing order is 40. Order, please. I thought my light was on. Since honorable members are having such a good time interrupting and interjecting one another, if it is your wish, it is your house, you all will continue that way. However, the member for Labry st stood on a point of order, and I think the point he was making was that there was a little too much interruption as the honorable leader of the opposition was on his feet. And I will read, standing order 40, both 34 and 40, correction. A member on his feet shall be heard in silence unless it is a point of interruption. Please proceed, Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, what I'm speaking of too is the human cost of, this, of these people losing their jobs. And Madam Speaker, it's okay for us to be comfortable, we are ministers, we have a good life, we eat in hotels, etc. But you must understand the cost, the human cost, Madam Speaker. You must understand the human cost for these people. So we laugh, we laugh. People lose their jobs, we laugh. 90% of them are, are, are their parties of order, so it, it, it doesn't really matter. We laugh. People lose their jobs, let them cry. We, have, we don't care that. We're big, we run <coughs> things, we control. So, Madam Speaker, so I want to ask the Prime Minister to have a little heart. Have a little heart for these people when you intend to restructure these organizations. Madam Speaker, in the budget, the Prime Minister spoke about something called NAPS, N-A-P-S. And in that NAPS, there is $10 million for NAPS. Madam Speaker, I want to just ask a few questions. How do we decide what firms 
that we give NAPS money? How do we, how do we decide? What, because you see, that ten million dollars is not from is not from your pocket, you know. That ten million dollars is from the taxpayers of the country. And and I'm coming. Just wait for me. You have given one thousand dollars. You promised to give a foreign firm one thousand dollars per employee, and you've never said so in the honorable house. You have promised to give a foreign firm one thousand dollars per employee for four years. For, a, for an amount for four years, you came here and you spoke about a firm called Ojo Labs International. You boasted about it. But you did not tell the Honorable House that you intend to take $1,000 and $500 per employee to pay that firm, and it's open ended. You have no conditions under which you give that employee that thousand, you give that foreign firm $1,000 per employee. And you are the same person that, that, that complained when you say that we had people working at true value. The same person. But, you have a, but once it's a local, you have problems with it. But a foreign firm, you have decided that you will give them $1,000 per employee and $500 per employee. And you read a budget statement in some house, and you refuse. You refuse to tell the Honorable House that you are doing that. <coughs> Lack of transparency. And no matter what mechanics you tell me for six months, nine months, three months, two hours, the fact is, the fact is, you were not transparent. You did not tell this honorable house that when you spoke about artificial intelligence and Ojo Labs, you had also decided that you would give employees of Sailwinds Limited and Crawlin Al Limited $1,000 per employee and $500 per employee. Both. But you know, you know, but in the interest of transparency, if you're boasting about, if you're boasting about, about work in the South, you tell the people, tell the public that you've taken their money and you've given a foreign firm $1,000 per employee and $500 per employee. That's what you've done. So, Madam Speaker, I want to also know what is the role of the National Skills Development Center? What is their role? Why do you have to take government money and put in private sector enterprises? Why, and for training, why do you have to take government's money and give training to private sector enterprises? You must be transparent. You must say, who are the people in these schools? Who runs these schools? Who owns these schools? Who, what is the curriculum of these schools? Who are the owners of these schools? Who are the indirect and direct beneficiaries? When you take government's money and you give to the private sector in terms of training you must say the whole truth because you have an N and a national development skills <coughs> center that can do all that you must be transparent and open you see so madam speaker the the point is we need to know who are the owners who are the shareholders who are the affiliations of these educational institutions that you intend to put a NAPS money in. We must be open and transparent. We intend, we intend, you must tell the public of St. Lucia, Madam Speaker, how, who is benefiting from these 10 million, from that $10 million that you're gonna take for your NAPS program. You must tell them. Yes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, and you know, this special Ojo Labs International Firm, they operate in a free zone. They are in a free zone, Madam Speaker, and they have more, they have, in, they have natural incentives from the free zone. But this government has given them more incentives to buy boats and cars. This government is promising that they will give Ojo Limited a special firm. They have them operating in a free zone. They have all the incentives from the free zone, but they're going to get them more incentives, including a promise to get them incentives to buy boats and cars. Ojo from Ojo is, is called Ojo Labs International Inc. And it runs two firms in St. Lucia. And um, sales, Sale World Limited and Current Al Limited. But, Madam Speaker, these companies are special. Make something special about them. They make something special about them. 
the amount of young people who want to start, who want to begin internet-based business. The amount of young people who want to make, who want to create websites. The amount of young people who are in information technology. But you don't have confidence in your own people. No, you have to get a foreign firm. You have to pay a foreign firm. And you come in this honorable house, lack of transparency, you boast about Ojo International, but you do not tell the people of the country that you promise to give them $1,000 per employee and $500 per employee. And they operate in a free zone, and they're going to get extra incentives from being in that free zone. That is the, and that is the, what this government is prepared to do for special people. Madam Speaker, the, the, the Prime Minister said that they're going to build five hotels. I've heard five hotels before. In Miku, I heard there have been five hotels in Miku. So I've heard that before. It's the Prime Minister's habit of saying five. He was campaigning in Miku, and he said there have been five hotels in Miku. Five, five. You like five to stay alive. Five hotels in Miku. So now you're going to build five, five hotels in St. Lucia. All right, no problem. If they build five hotels in St. Lucia, I'd be very grateful. I'd be pleased. If they build five, I'd be pleased. Because people will get employed. And on, on, even though I know they send their list to hotel managers and tell them only employ people on that list. I know they do that. I know they do that. But I, I'll be because, you see, even though when UWPs get a job, man, speaker, there is something called everybody benefits because the UWP have a labor boyfriend or a labor girlfriend or a labor godchild. So if you would get five hotels for two, if you'd build five hotels for two, and people will get will employed. I'll be happy. You think we'll sit here and we'll be against you building five hotels? We won't do that. We'll be glad if you do that. But, Madam Speaker, but you give the impression that all these hotels were yours. That you are the ones. It's because you came back. You've generated so much confidence in the economy. You have free airlines coming in without paying any, any, without paying any revenue sharing. So you've been so good because you, 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 because you are in government, Madam Speaker. But, 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 Madam Speaker, let me tell you something. Of these five hotels, Royalton was negotiated by us. The hotel on the Pope side was negotiated by us. The hotels on was, was, was negotiated by, by us, Madam Speaker. We were the ones who spoke to them, spoke with them, the same way you speak into the SH. We were the ones who negotiated for the hotel in Chozel, and our spokesman for investment will, 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 will say a lot more about that. Of, of these hotels, tell the people of St. Lucia that many of these neg negotiations were started and, and, and nearly completed by us. So why must you give the impression that because you're back in power, because there's so much confidence that all these hotels happen to come all, all in a sudden. That, 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 that did not happen. So I'm waiting to see you build five hotels. I'll be very happy if you build five hotels. Because even though you try, even at that level, to victimize our employees to get a job there, I'll be happy if the solutions get to work in the five hotels. But, Madam Speaker, in one, this government, in its vindictiveness, <coughs> they dealt a mortal blow to the jazz festival. Here is a government that had a festival that was among the first, the best 10 festivals in the world. A world-renowned rec world festival. Everybody knew St. Lucia for the jazz festival. People used to plan their holidays in advance for the jazz festival. Because you want to be vindictive, you've done no survey, you've done no market survey, you've done nothing, you have unilaterally and on your own, you just decide that you're going to downgrade the jazz festival. And you replace it with a festival commission. So people will plan five holidays per year. They'll come to your rum festival one month, next month they'll come to your your other festival. In, so instead of people coming for one festival, they'll come for five festivals. But, Madam Speaker, all countries have a marquee festival. 
all countries. There is, all countries have a festival that they are known for in the entire world. You had the jazz festival. You could, you could deal with it in a certain way. But just because you want to be vindictive, you've just downgraded the jazz festival. This week is jazz. We will see the amount of visitors we have for jazz. And we'll compare it to what happened last year and the year before. And, and, and you know what you say? You say because you want to save costs. But, but, but you're saving costs, but, but why is you saving costs? You are, <laughs> why is you saving costs, Madam Speaker? You are increasing the cost of travel to St. Lucia by increasing the travel tax on the taxpayers, on the, on, on the, on the visitors. So, Madam Speaker, we left to see the impact of your so-called re-engineered jazz. I'm saying to you that the benefit that the vendors had from jazz, the benefit that the people who got involved in the jazz festival, the speculators, the small boutique owners, the buzz that, that was around the country for jazz, that buzz does not exist as we speak. That doesn't exist. Why? Because you were irrational, you were hasty, and you were vindictive. So, so Madam Speaker, you have downgraded a world-class event, Madam Speaker. Now, you've dissolved the St. Lucia Tourist Board, and the excuse you give is the Tourist Board had liabilities. I want to put it to you. What was the liabilities, what were the liabilities of the Tourist Board in 1997? And what were the liabilities of the Tourist Board in 2011? Because you've closed it down, because I said it has liabilities. Bring the financial statements and tell me what were the liabilities of the Tourist Board in 1997 and in 2011 when you took it over. But you've closed it down. But, Madam Speaker, whilst you are closing it down, you are closing it down for a tourism authority. We await patiently the legislation as it relates to that tourism authority. Because I'm putting it to you that all what the tourist, the tourism authority was doing or will be doing, the tourist board could do it. There was no need, except if you wanted to victimize people. There was no need. If you wanted to have a change, you could have changed from the you could have changed the apparatus as it as in terms of staff, etc., in the tourist board without dissolving the, the the that the board as it existed. But again, you want to you want to you want to target certain people. So you dissolve a whole house, a whole board to, to target certain people. This government will burn a house to kill a rat. That is, that, is, that, is, that is a level of vindictiveness just to target somebody. And I will not tell you I will not behave because I shared personal correspondence with the Prime Minister. I wouldn't say it in this house. I, because I, I will say it in this house. I will never say it in this house. I will not behave like you. The, because you want to target somebody. That's why you dissolve the... the, the the, that, the board is, that, 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 that's not right. That is not right. Don't do people that. These people are solutions. Do, don't do them that. Because many people, there are some of you who will labor rights. You all run for us. And you all turn your back. And now you all hate us. <laughs> we, we, and we, and we, we, that is the nature of politics. That's, that, we, we, that's, that's the nature of politics. That's the nature of politics. But you know, but you want to behave as if because somebody is labor, because somebody's labor, you want to destroy them. No matter who they are. Grass cutters, civil servants, former ministers, MPs. All of them are speaking. You want to victimize them because you think they are labor. Nice workers. So, Madam Speaker, you have a tourism policy, tourism authority, but you have increased the airport tax and all studies. The Caribbean Development Bank study has said to you that the elasticity of demand for tourism, for air travel, is very elastic. And any change of price affects it. We came here and we told you so. I quoted for you a Caribbean Development Bank study. You didn't take me on. You laughed at me as usual. You laughed. It's a joke. You're in power, so you can laugh. And right now, the SLHTA had to tell you that that is bad policy. 
in the fake tourism arrivals. So you pulled it back. And you promised that you will help them in some, in some way, but there's nothing in the budget that says where you, where you will help them. You speak about tourism, but you've increased St. Lucia's problem is that it is a high cost destination. But you've increased the price of gasoline by $1.50 per gallon. So you've affected your tourism industry. Because you've made St. Lucia a higher cost destination. But that's what you've done. And you see, that is, these are the repercussions of your actions. When, when you believe you did in one way, you affect other things. So right now, you've made St. Lucia more expensive as a destination. You speak about hotels. What are you doing about Wasco? What are you doing about giving, was, giving water to these hotels? When you're in government, you may, you may have forgotten that. We did the piping from Grosile in, into Grosile to feed these hotels. You may have forgotten that. We did that. And right now, I'm sure that the capacity of that, of that sector is, la is too large for the water that's available. So what are you doing about water? These are the things you must think of, Madam Speaker. What are you doing? What is the water? Where is the allocation for Wasco for, for water in, for Wasco in the budget? But Madam Speaker, Wasco had perfect management. The management of Wasco and up to now, the people of Cassius East will tell you that water in Cassius East is much, is much more regular than before because of work done in Wasco. But you know, Madam Speaker, you allow Wasco management to leave. You, 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 why? Because you believe that Wasco, the manager of Wasco, wasn't one of you, not, not one of us. So you, that's what you've done, Madam Speaker. So I'm saying to you that You'll have issues with, with water when it comes to your development of tourism. What are you doing for the yachting sector, a major sector? What are you doing for the yachting sector in your tourism, in your tourism plan? Nothing about, nothing about that sector. Another important sector, man speaker. So I'm saying to you that even in tourism, the tourism that you proclaim that is your engine of growth, you have serious shortcomings in that regard. So, Madam Speaker, I want now to briefly deal with DSH. An incredible thing happened yesterday, Madam Speaker. Incredible. Incredible. An investor came in this honorable house and he sat in a privileged position. The Prime Minister referred to him and all the members of, of the government bench. <laughs> Madam Speaker, that's incredible. It's the most incredible thing I have seen in my 20 years here. It's the most incredible thing I have seen, Madam Speaker. It was inc I couldn't believe I was seeing that. Boot Stewart has investments in St. Lucia, major tourism investment. Boot Stewart was here some time ago. I, was, I don't think most of you all here were, were inside here because you must have certain kind of metal to be here, like you and I, for so long. You understand? Nobody never, that the Prime Minister at the time, never said, hey, hey it's Mr. Bush Stewart. Never said so. Because Mr. Stewart was here as an investor coming to listen to what's happened in the house. But you, you are so... You want to drive it home so much because you believe you have such a good thing. You have the investor in the house and you recognize him. And all of you, if you know how you look doing that, if you know how St. Lucians felt, especially St. Lucians abroad, felt about you as you're doing that, you'd never laugh. Anyhow, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Madam Speaker, the DSH, the DSH is not a regular investment. We behave as if DSH is a regular investment. It's not a regular investment. It's not a simple investment. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister says that DSH will give 500 jobs 
How many jobs? 5,000 jobs, or whatever I said. Madam Speaker, Royalton Hotel has 1,000 employees. It doesn't exist on 900 acres of land. Why you need to give an investor 900 acres of land? Cat blanche. But Madam Speaker, the strange thing is, the Prime Minister says that that's such a good investment, but he refuses to make the agreement that he signed a document of this honorable house. If the agreement is such a good one, if it has so many benefits for the, for the people of St. Lucia, if we are wicked and we hate St. Lucia and we are against progress and the member for Viewfort South wants to leave Viewfort in darkness, why can't you make the DSH agreements or agreement a document of the house? You talk about Grindberg. You talk about Grindberg. Grindberg was made a document of the house. It was made on 9th of April, 2009. Check your records. Don't test me on that. Grindberg was a document of the house. We are saying to you to make the DSH agreement. The DSH agreement. If you say it's false, make it a document of the house. If you say it is, it is not the right document, make it a document of the house. So, Madam Speaker, since you refuse to make it a, a document of the house, I have now copies of the document that was on the internet. I have copies of the document that was, that was on the internet in my possession. The government, has, the government has not said that that document is wrong. So I'm assuming, and, and I'm presuming and assuming, that since this document on the internet has the signature of the Honorable Prime Minister and a gentleman called... Chang Sipo on one, and Tio A King on another one, and this doc and the document has on this other one it has the signature of Alan M Chastney, Pinkley Francis, Tio A King, and something I don't understand. Since these documents are in circulation, I am going to quote from them. I'm going to quote from them. And I want you to tell me that what I have quoted is not right. Because you refuse. You refuse to make, and there is precedent to that. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, if you wish to quote these documents, you need, as I alluded to earlier on when I started, you need to make copies available so as and when you read, members can follow from the same document. Do you wish time to send it downstairs to be copied? Yes. If you so. Rude. Yes, I will suggest that. So, Madam Speaker, for the record, I am making these two agreements as circulated on the internet, a document of the house. So, Madam Speaker, whilst we await Whilst we await that document from the House, I will continue with my presentation, Madam Speaker. You see, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister said that our heritage, our patrimony is in our credit, our credit what? Our credit ratings. That's where our patrimony is. But, Madam Speaker, the people of Viewfort, the people of Viewfort have a rich history. And for those who do not know, let me tell you something about the history of Viewfort and the history of the lands in Viewfort. There is something about the lands in Viewfort that has great historical value, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Viewfort was the site of the first European settlement in 1605. It was the site of the first sugar mill in this country in 1763. It was the site of important migrations from India and Barbados and to work in the sugar factories in the late 1800s and 1900s. It was the site of U.S. Binfield airfield during World War II. The lands of many Vifortians were lost during that time. Eventually, it was George Charles, as chief minister in this Labour Party, who regained the 500 acres of land from the Americans in the early 1960s and began 
developing it by building a secondary school, etc. The first secondary school to be located out of Cashews was built by George Charles in Viewport. The people of Viewport, Madam Speaker, have seen colonization. The people of Viewport understand what is happening to their lands. The people of Viewfort have a right to guard their lands jealously. The people of Viewfort, Madam Speaker, they have a right to query when 900 acres of their land are given to one man for 99 years. They have a right, Madam Speaker. So you cannot say, you cannot say that because you believe, because you believe that an investment is good, you can sit in your cabinet, sit and sign these deals, and refuse to discuss it with the people of St. Lucia. Sir John Compton, when he had the Hess Agreement, when John Compton was signing the Hess Agreement, there was people were saying, why are you giving Hess such a large area of land? Nothing as much as what you give in DSH. Sir John Compton, in his wisdom, came to this honorable house. He put the Hess Agreement on the table. And he said, let us discuss it. Every elected member had a chance to discuss this agreement. And in the final analysis, everybody voted yes, even though some of them tear it up. You, you understand? So, so, Madam Speaker, what we are saying to this government is if you have such a good agreement, if this agreement will transform the face of Viewfort, if we are so wicked, we do not want to have development in Viewfort. If you want, if you want to, to do so many things in Viewfort, bring the agreement to this honorable house or say to the people of the country, that the agreement that's been circulated on the internet is false. It wasn't me who put it there. I don't know who put it there, but it was the internet. The agreement on the internet is false. What you've signed is wrong. And this little party is lying. Madam Speaker, on a point of order, point 34, I rise, 34A, to say, Madam Speaker, that unless my learned colleague can show the authenticity of the document, then he cannot present it. Who, who, I have not said the government has not acknowledged that that information is correct. So therefore, unless he can substantiate to you, Madam Speaker, that he knows who the author and the authenticity of that document, I have to say that he cannot submit it to the House. You can't just take a document from the internet and claim it to be an authentic document, and we're going to bring it to this honorable House. He cannot do that. I, the government's position has been that we have signed a confidential agreement and we have not acknowledged in any way that the documents that are in are in circulation are correct, Madam Speaker. Do I continue? Please bear with me. No chair, please.
Honorable Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I ask if we can adjourn the House for 15 minutes. Honorable Members, the question is that this House be suspended for 15 minutes. It is time that I believe that I need. Thank you. Um, as 15 minutes, as many as of that opinion say aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. This house is suspended for 15 minutes. We shall return at 25 past six. All right. Speaker, will I get my time? At this juncture, the house is gone for 15 minute recess so far we have been hearing from the leader of the opposition who is still into his presentation so we'll be hearing from the leader of the opposition uh, when the house resumes please stay tuned to the national television network for the resumption of the house momentarily